Today, we'll continue to explore the concept of what it means to be a global citizen, how we define it for ourselves, and how we live it. Our distinguished speakers are living in the US, but their work certainly has a global impact. We hope you find today's discussion to be insightful and engaging. We ask that if you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Google form that we are sharing with you now through the chat function. And now I'd like to welcome Ray Offenheiser, a member of the Notre Dame class of 1971. Ray is the William J. Pulte Director for the Pulte Institute for Global Development and an Associate Professor of the Practice in the Keough School of Global Affairs. He teaches graduate and undergraduate students where he leads a course on the foundations of sustainable development. Prior to returning to Notre Dame in 2017, Ray was the president of Oxfam America. This organization is a Boston-based international relief and development, development or agency. And he was their president for over 20 years. His research interests and areas of expertise include poverty alleviation, human rights, US foreign policy, and international development. He has been a frequent commentator with US and international media on these and other subjects. Ray is gonna to moderate today's discussion, but before I turn it over to him, I'd like to ask, um, Ray, you've been a practitioner in this area for several decades. How has the concept of global citizenship changed over time from your perspective? Great, thanks, Mary, and welcome to all of our uh, viewers today. Um, maybe a quick response to, to that, I think very good question that will, I think, get us jump started. Um, so you could say that, um, I think probably it's appropriate to say that the whole term of global citizenship became part of our common vocabulary probably within the last 20, 25 years, as we all began to realize that globalization was now a part of our lives, a real part of our lives. Uh, however, you could also say uh, comfortably that perhaps the term or at least the idea was around for about 100 years since the 1920s, when Woodrow Wilson really actually started trying to create the League of Nations. Although he, you know, he made an enormous effort, and there wasn't, you know, there are there were buildings built in Geneva, and efforts were made to kind of convene this body. It wasn't a very, it wasn't a considerable success. However, after the Second World War, the United Nations and the whole system of multilateral institutions were created. Um, the Roosevelt administration and Harry Truman played an enormous role in that, and that really advanced the idea of, you know, greater global collaboration, and perhaps advanced the idea of global citizenship in a, in a very real way. The idea that we should all be collaborating, looking for ways to sustain the peace globally. I think there was a real fear that we would be, we could fall again into global conflicts of the sort that we saw during the First and Second World War and, and see the loss of literally millions of lives. And I don't think anybody wanted that. And in, 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 in thinking about it in the era of the nuclear age, that was actually something even more terrifying a thought. So we created these institutions in some sense to foster global citizenship and global collaboration. Uh, in the interest of global peace. However, I think in the 1990s, the term sort of became some, even more important because now with the integration of global markets and the acceleration of trade and the integration of economies, we have become such so much more interdependent, I think. Um, and now the, the term has, I think, you know, much more profound and, and, and a different sort of meaning. And I think the core of the meaning is we live in an interdependent world. We're collectively responsible for peace and security throughout the world and the, and the care of the climate. And you know, our security depends on everyone's security, I think you could probably fairly say in, in today's world. Um, while we've worked very hard, I think it's fair to say over the last 70 years to build a global community and advance the idea of global collaboration. Um, today, we're seeing the rise of nationalist governments um, that are eschewing this idea. In other words, you know, we're seeing challenges to the United Nations, to the idea of multilateralism. We're seeing sort of exceptionalism in the way countries are um, you know, behaving. And so the multilateral system today is, is uh, under threat. And, uh, and I think this perhaps presents one of the greater challenges for the 21st century as we go forward. So with that, um, uh, there are many people, I, I just wanna shift now to our panel, which, and I'm very excited to, to, to be able to host and moderate today. There are lots of people across the US and specifically fellow Notre Dame alumni who really live out val the value of global citizenship in their daily lives, both here in the United States and around the world. Um, 
these next two, two weeks, um, today and next week, we're going to have the opportunity to meet four of them. Uh, today, I'm delighted uh, to introduce you to two friends who are also fellow alumni who've been making major contributions as global citizens over the last many decades. Um, and so today we're gonna be joined by Michael Camilleri, class of 2000, director of the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, DC, and Tara Kenny, class of 82, um, uh, who, who is chair of TCK Global Advisors and, the, and is on the advisory council along with me at the, at the Kellogg Institute uh, here at the University of Notre Dame. So maybe just to get us going, Tara, um, I'd like to start with you. You've had really, I, uh, I'd like to say, a pretty extraordinary career in international finance and largely focused on work in Latin America over the last 30 years. And I think I'm, I'm reasonably accurate to say that you worked in that period during a, a time of incredible change, time when there was economic crisis, democratization, followed by really quite dramatic economic growth. I think it would be really interesting for you to share some of your background, your experience at Notre Dame and, and what the, how that experience shaped and formed uh, the work you've done over these last 30 years in Latin America and beyond, both in the for-profit and not-for-profit sector, because you've been very active in both. Well, thank you, Ray, and good afternoon to all. It's wonderful to see you here. And I'm humbled and honored um, both to be a part of this new series. First, I'd like to actually send my sympathies to those who may have lost loved ones during this period of COVID-19, and certainly to many who are suffering economic hardship as a result of COVID um, and the economic downturn in our economy and our world. We'll talk about that today. And of course, more recently, all of the natural disasters. Um, to say we're living in an unprecedented time, which is often used, is an understatement. And I'm actually called, I find myself summoning Father Ted's words over and over, the come Holy Spirit, which was his daily, daily mantra. And his legacy when I graduated and when Ray graduated and many of you to go forth and do good, you know, as he told us on our commencement, in my case, <laughs> nearly 40 years ago, um, those words ring loud and clear and true today. I refer to my life as being centered on my three Fs, my faith, my finance background, and my, in the Spanish, philanthropia or philanthropy, um, as a way to pay it back, pay it forward uh, for all of the good that I've had in my life. Um, much of which has come through Notre Dame, both my education, which was an incredibly enriching experience, and then my current role on the Kellogg Institute at the Keough School, working with Ray for about two decades now, Ray, I think we go back, um, in helping Notre Dame chart its way forward in the international arena. This has opened doors to me as a global citizen, um, which I hope to share with you today. Uh, after Notre Dame, I uh, headed to Lima, Peru, uh, where actually Ray spent some good time as well. Uh, and I worked in the slums of Lima as a young graduate student in a field called microfinance, which I'll talk about today in my work in impact investing, which has been a thread through my life for the last 40 years, harnessing the capital markets to alleviate poverty. After my formative years at, in Lima, uh, I spent three decades in New York and now in Boston, working as a banker and an investor, first on Wall Street in the early days in the 1980s, uh, a minority woman, I would say, certainly working for these firms in New York. And I witnessed the, the transformation, as Ray alluded to, of the region of Latin America from the days of the lost decade and the debt crises that were confronting the governments in 1982 through the 90s, an opening of the capital markets after that, um, huge amount of money coming back to the region once the debt was settled, the rise of extremely successful corporations that, that are around today, and a lot of investment by foreigners of all of us, um, not to mention some very, very sound economic systems built in the region, which last today, such as the Chilean pension system, which I would say is arguably much better than ours. While we were celebrating all these successes in the region of its transformation, a growing middle class, the alleviation of abject poverty and prosperity, there was still a socioeconomic divide between the haves and haves not. Um, I saw this firsthand through my travels, through my work in my various non-for-profit boards, and I felt I needed to do, to do something to bridge this divide. This work I'll share with you today as it relates to an organization called Acción International, a pioneer and leader in the world of microfinance or financial inclusion. 
uh, which bridges the divide between those that have the capital and those that need it. Um, my Notre Dame roots and Father Ted's legacy to connect for the good have been a constant source of inspiration to me. And I'd be remiss here if I didn't give one shout out to another very important part of my life uh, and my role as a global citizen, and that's my work in global health, particularly in Latin America. Uh, I was introduced by Father Ted about maybe 20 years or so ago to a wonderful organization that he and Dr. David Gauss from the proud class of ND84, a couple years behind me, started called Andean Health and Development, a model in sustainable healthcare delivery to the rural poor, putting up hospitals, including Hesburgh Hospital on the rural course of the coast of Ecuador where there were no facilities before. We'll talk about that today as well as an example of sustainable investing in a social good, and that being access to health for the underserved. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. And uh, I, having shared those uh, all those meetings <laughs> over 20 years at the Kellogg Institute, I can attest to uh, the passion that you've uh, you've built up for these issues over the years. Um, Michael, you work today for the Inter-American Dialogue which is currently the leading think tank on inter-American relations uh, or US Latin American relations uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, in, your daily, in your daily work, you're dealing with uh, heads of state, you're dealing with government officials, for, you know, minister, president, former ministers, um, and leading business leaders from both North and South America. And you're frequently at the table with leading policymakers in Washington, DC who shape Latin American, US Latin American relations. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your work and background, your experiences at Notre Dame, and how it contributes to the work you do today with the dialogue and in the region. Sure. Thanks, Ray. I'm so honored to be with you and with, with Tara. It's, it's really, uh, as Tara mentioned, I think a, a challenging time for, for many of us and great to be uh, among friends and, and among donors. So um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I, I'm especially delighted to participate in a conversation about global citizenship because it's uh, an identity I very much embrace. Um, uh, Theresa May famously said that if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. Uh, I, I take this series as a firm rejection uh, of, that, of that notion. Uh, and I think that's consistent with um, Notre Dame's values and, and mission. So, um, you know, for me as uh, first of all, as an immigrant to the United States, as somebody who's lived in eight countries for uh, periods of time ranging from a few months to, to many years, uh, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, somebody whose career has been built around issues of human rights, international relations, uh, foreign policy, and, and especially with a focus on Latin America, um, you know, I feel very much home, at home in, in, this, uh, in this conversation. Uh, so thank you for, for bringing us together. Um, you know, in terms of my experience at Notre Dame and, and how it's kind of shaped um, my career and what I do now, I think, you know, the first thing to say is um, uh, the, the kind of pillars of my career have been human rights in Latin America. And of course, Notre Dame, when I was there, was one of the world's leading centers for uh, comparative politics in Latin America and also had a really top notch center for civil and human rights at the law school. Um, I, I am really embarrassed to say that I, I went through four years at Notre Dame without having much idea that either of these things existed. Uh, so so some, some people may wonder what I was doing instead, uh, but we'll, we'll leave that for the Q&A. Um, but I, I was uh, extremely fortunate to find some incredible mentors um, and teachers at Notre Dame who uh, not only challenged me intellectually, but, but challenged me to think about um, and imbue in me a, a sense of responsibility to community, both local and, and global. Uh, and that's, um, that's, I think, what's, what's really kind of shaped uh, my, my approach to uh, my time at Notre Dame, my, my professional life. Uh, I think the best advice uh, I got as a student was at freshman orientation from Father Scully, who said, uh, leave um, in the sense of, you know, get out, get out of South Bend, go abroad. I did spend uh, a year in Spain as, as a junior. Um, and uh, the, the language skills in particular um, that, that I learned as a student have been fundamental to everything I've done since. Um, uh, starting in the NGO sector, working in, in Guatemala straight out of law school, and then as a, a human rights lawyer working in, in Colombia, especially Brazil, uh, Peru, and some other places. Um, then moving to the Organization of American States, a multilateral institution uh, focused on the Americas, uh, working in the US government at the State Department and the White House, and, and now, uh, as you mentioned, at the Inter-American Dialogue, which um, 
prides itself on being a convener, on being able to bring together um, uh, people of good faith, leaders from uh, government, civil society, business, uh, to think about um, you know, the really challenging issues of our time. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have a chance to, uh, to talk about some of those issues, but uh, I'll leave it there, Ray, and let us continue the conversation. Great, well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm gonna turn a moment now back to maybe to, to Tara and to the whole issue of, of finance and uh, access to finance um, in Latin America and across the world over the last, probably last 60 to 70 years in driving, it's been really important in driving the outcomes in international development. Uh, however, for many years, these issue, these, this finance has been directed largely to infrastructure and the building of a manufacturing sector across the continent. More recently, however, there's uh, been a shift. There's been a really a shift toward can we harness the market and can we shift investment toward social good, social purpose, uh, and what has been called um, uh, a new, there's a new term uh, and a rubric, which is social or impact investing. The Global Impact Investing Network defines impact investing as investments made with the intention of generating positive, measurable social and environmental impacts alongside financial returns. Today, these investments provide really important capital across the region as made with the intention of generating, uh, excuse me, uh, these investments provide capital to the world's most pressing challenges across the region in areas such as sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, conservation, microfinance basics and basic services in the areas of housing, healthcare, and education. So Tara, you have been an active player in this field literally for pretty much your entire career. So I think it would really be interesting for all of us to hear a, a, lot, of, a lot more about what you, how you see that field evolving, um, what, you, what you see as some really interesting success stories and, uh, and where you think that work is going today in terms of getting to scale. Great, Ray, thank you for that. And before I jump in here, it might help to provide a little bit of context on, on that lexicon that Ray just raised of investing. What was once a bit of a fad or a peripheral investment class for the do-gooders um, has now become really a part of our mainstream investment world. Uh, if you pick up any newspaper today, you'll see full page ads by, for example, Morgan Stanley Capital for Change. Um, and it's really become part of, of the mantra. Um, it's known as social responsible investing. It's known as sustainable investing, ESG investing. I'll refer to that today through the course of my talk, which means environmental, social, and good governance investing, taking those things into account when the company makes its decisions. Um, or mission-based investing. That's an early one that the religious used. And the religious communities were one of the very first participants in this world. It can be a bit confusing, a little bit of an alphabet soup, um, but basically it means investing with one's values, taking them to account when you create your portfolios, whether it's stock portfolios, bond portfolios, or even private equity portfolios, um, which is a smaller part, but a very important part of this world um, to make good and do and for social change. Up till recently, uh, there were some pundits to this type of investing saying, you can't invest this way and generate a good return. Uh, you have to be given something up to do good, either for the environment or for those areas Ray just alluded to, help raising healthcare standards, raising environmental standards, et cetera. Thankfully, this has been debunked more recently and you'll see the most astute investors today acknowledging that by taking into account these environmental, social, and good governance criteria in your investment thinking that you generate outsized returns, better returns than the market, and you actually hedge the risk of your portfolios. My work um, over the last four or five years has been largely with faith-based institutions. Uh, I mentioned they were some of the early movers in this space. Um, and it's worth noting that my roots going back to Lima, Peru in 1982, and my uh, project work I did with Acción at the time, uh, was largely funded by women religious and the very same Adrian Dominicans uh, that I work with today as uh, the head of Catholic Charities USA, uh, my boss, I call her Sister Donna Markham, uh, Dominican nun from my hometown of Adrian, leads that charge. The Adrians were the ones who gave Axiom $5 million to on lend into Latin America to small businesses working in those rural slums. These are the women entrepreneurs who needed access to capital to grow their businesses, to grow their way out of poverty with dignity. Now, mind you, this might sound like pure altruism, 
But what it did was it established the link between the ability to invest for social change and return. These largely women, um, because women were proven to be the better credit risk, um, the women that own these tiny businesses, these market stalls, et cetera, in Latin America, um, they repaid these loans, 100%, pretty much up to 100% repayment rates with market-based interest. It wasn't subsidized interest. It proved that the poor can be reliable stewards of capital and help grow businesses and force change. Flash forward 40 years from that, my little roots in Lima, and now you've got trillions. Ray alluded to the amount of money going into this type of investment class. Approximately 40 trillion today is invested in ESG and impact investing vehicles. That's roughly half of all the assets invested by uh, traditional money managers. Um, the likes of Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, BlackRock, and Morgan Stanley have all jumped on this bandwagon. And it's safe to say the style of investing is here to stay. I'll just close by saying that while it's encouraging that these vehicles exist and the amount of money is moving to help solve poverty, at least 3 billion people today are left out of the financial mainstream. That means the world's poor don't have access to savings vehicles, obviously lending and loans that they need to grow their businesses and insurance, which is extremely important if you're poor. I'll talk about a mechanism later on today in Africa um, where we're providing insurance to crop growers in Kenya. This has led to a tremendous loss of livelihood. And especially after COVID-19, this work in providing access to capital to the poor is ever more needed. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Ray. I believe Ray's muted. So Michael, um, since the founding of the uh, uh, Inter-American Dialogue, I think its founding premise was really to promote ongoing active dialogue among leaders in the, in the region in pursuit of good governance, human rights, and, and to fight uh, corruption and achieve social, greater degrees of social equity. Uh, since its creation, it's provided space, I think really important space for challenging, con for particularly challenging conversations over sensitive topics while working to shape policy and enhance cooperation throughout the Western Hemisphere. Um, in my own view, and I've, I've been a friend of the dialogue for a long time, its real strength are its partnerships with individuals and institutions across the social and political spectrum in areas of, of really crucial importance to the region, such as education, rule of law, human rights, energy, and so forth. Could you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing, convenience, convening senior figures, figures in the region around such topics as rule of law, human rights, and corruption? And it would really be nice if you could sort of take us in the room a little bit and paint a picture for us of what this work might be really like. Sure, Ray. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you've you've just kind of described the ethos very well. And I will say uh, you feature in some of the war stories of our, our president, Michael Shifter. So we uh, we definitely consider you family at the Inter-American Dialogue. But uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, the dialogue was born in the, in the early 1980s. And um, uh, I think both you and Tara have alluded to this. That was a tough time. It was a time of armed conflict in the region, of military dictatorships, um, a time of deeply polarized uh, debate uh, in Washington about the U.S. role in Latin America, including uh, our support for some of those dictatorships. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, in, that, in that very challenging context, the, the kind of founding premise was if we can just bring leaders of good faith together, even if they are from different countries, different backgrounds, different political persuasions, if we can create a space where they sit around a table, we can begin to identify and advance uh, problems to or solutions to, to the hemisphere's most vexing problems, um, whether that was you know the debt price crises and the and, and the civil wars of the time, or you know nowadays uh, challenges of, of public corruption, migration from Central America, financial inclusion, early childhood development, deforestation in the Amazon. The problem set ha has evolved over time as the region has, but the the basic model of how to uh, how to approach those problems has not. Uh, and I think for me having you know, seen the dialogue from the outside and now being part of the, the organization, what's really impressive is that having a track record of doing this over four decades gives you as an organization 
a deep reservoir of respect and admiration um, for, for having played this convenient role for so long. So, you know, to give you one example, we had a, a discussion once in which there were two very kind of prominent Colombian politicians uh, who were participating in a, in a heated but respectful uh, debate about regional issues. And at the end of the, the discussion, they said, you know, the two of us could never have this conversation in Colombia. Um, it's just too polarized. It's just too, too sensitive, too heated. Um, and, and you really need an institution like the dialogue to create a safe political space where these uh, conversations can, can take place. And this sort of political collaboration and, and solutions-based um, uh, ethos can, can really uh, be given kind of the, the, the breathing space to prosper. And so for me personally, you know, when I think about how do we, how do we approach the crisis in Venezuela or how do we think about um, the root causes of, and the structural causes of, of corruption in the region, um, the, 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 the most powerful asset that I have at my disposal is the ability to tap into this network of relationships with leaders in, in politics, in business, in civil society, uh, bring that expertise and, and, and those diverse perspectives to bear on a particular problem uh, and use them that not, not only to sort of generate ideas, but to generate in, concrete impact on those critical issues. So, so Michael, maybe just to kind of, you know, keep that going a little bit. Um, in recent decades, we've seen increased distrust of, of expertise and global elites across the political spectrum, both in the US um, and Latin America, and probably it's fair to say around the world. We've seen major political figures in Latin America fall victim to widespread corruption scandals, threatening democratic stability and progress across the regions. Uh, and this is an area that you, you know, given your particular brief, have, you know, are working on on a daily basis. How do you feel like these emergent trends are affecting, you know, commitment to multilateralism, trans, you know, transnational partnership, and so forth, um, and particularly as it would pertain to U.S. Latin American relations going forward? Yeah. So I, I mean, I'd be interested in, in your perspective and, and Tara's as much as my own on this. But I, look, I think it's going to be a challenging time. Um, you know well that uh, indicators in Latin America were not great even before the pandemic. Uh, economic growth had had stalled, especially in the large economies. Uh, citizen trust in democracy uh, and government uh, institutions was uh, at its lowest point in a couple of decades. You had these major corruption scandals, which uh, were positive in the sense of generating a, a real demand for accountability. But unfortunately, much of what came out of that, or, or one of the things that came out of that was the election in places like Mexico and Brazil and elsewhere of these populist authoritarians who were posing as political outsiders uh, promising to shake up the system, but are actually, in many cases, making things uh, even worse. And now on top of that, you have COVID. Um, and that is having really devastating uh, public health and economic consequences for the region. You know, we could lose 20 years in terms of poverty reduction, uh, in addition to hundreds of thousands of lives. So um, that could be um, an environment in which reform and renewal could, could sort of bubble up. And I think a lot of us are, are invested in, in, in that part of the project, but I think we should also be prepared if history is any guide for you know, renewed social protest, for um, political turbulence, uh, and potentially for democratic uh, backsliding and, and instability. Um, so you know, what does that mean for US Latin American relations and, and putting on my old State Department hat for, for a second? You know, I think you know, briefly there's, there's a few implications that, that come to mind. The first is obviously we need to be engaged, we need to be present. Um, at, at this challenging time, you know, the, the U.S. has a lot to offer, I think, to the region. And, and so we need to we need to be there. Um, uh, the second is, you know, we need to unex expect the unexpected uh, in, in a time of turbulence. There's been events in the past. I mean, the, the 2009 coup in Honduras, for example, um, you know, kind of consumed our Latin American policy and threw it off kilter for a period of time. So we need to be ready to, to kind of um, hopefully forestall some, some things like that, but also be ready to, to react if, if they do happen. Uh, and then finally, you know, we need to be, we need to wrestle with the fact that frankly, we're going to have some pretty mediocre and, and limited partners um, for some period of time. And, and that means, first of all, we need to be realistic in our expectations. But second, I think we need to be willing to stand up to stand up for our own values, for our own interests. Uh, on things like combating corruption, on defending human rights, and, and defending the environment. Thanks, Michael. Um, 
all three of us actually are all three of us actually are Latin Americanists by by profession, and all of us have spent a good deal of time in in the region. Um, and as I think you've heard from both of our speakers, this is a time of significant uh, transition uh, in the region. And um, I thought what I might do is instead of uh, in, in asking particular questions, maybe just throw it open a bit and have a little bit more of a freewheeling conversation that really focuses on um, the question of you know, how do we each of us see the region today? In other words, what gives us hope? Um, I think Michael got a little bit into this question now, what worries us? And then maybe what, you know, um, what has, it, you know, U.S. relations been like with the U.S., with, between the U.S. And, and Latin America over the last 20, 30 years? Um, and what could we be doing differently going forward? And I think Michael got kind of launches on that a little bit a minute ago, but maybe Tara, if you might want to jump in first, and sort of offer some ideas and maybe we'll go back and forth on this question as we, you know, as we close out the session and have a little bit more of a freewheeling conversation. Perfect. Any, any initial thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I think I'm unmuted. All set, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks, Ray and Michael. That, that is, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about Father Ted again and the importance of Latin America to the Notre Dame community for decades and decades. Um, we host many, many Latin Americans at our campus for four years. They go back to their countries. Uh, I think they try to make their, their worlds a better place. So the ties with this region are, are inextricable and they've been there for a long, long time. Um, Father Ted's role himself in terms of civil and human rights in the region, in terms of peace building, uh, his you know, monitoring the elections in Central America, his forming of the Kellogg Institute that Ray and I have been blessed to have served for these, these past two decades to bring democracy studies, to allow um, the, 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 the true leaders in the political movements in Argentina and Chile and Brazil to come and safely continue their work in democracy while these military regimes were you know, putting them sometimes at death threats. So, I mean, the, the picture, we're very intertwined with the region. Um, and, and still today, I think, Michael, like I'm, I think about the economic implications and, and you know, there's a lot of backlash on foreign trade and all of this and the NAFTA and did we get it right or didn't, didn't we get it right? But you know, the prosperity that was brought to the Mexican laborers and community, which um, really grew out of the good parts of NAFTA in just-in-time manufacturing and our companies investing for the future in Mexico, um, truly brought tremendous prosperity to that country. And while I, 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 true, I do fear for you for, with what you mentioned about going back to the last decade, given the economic situation that Latin America, it's probably the region most affected right now by COVID. Uh, New York Times had a great article today, which talked about the, it's, it, the, um, the incidence of COVID and deaths and, and whatnot is, is more than any, any place else in the world. And it's not going to, to dissipate anytime soon. Um, you know, it's a cry out that things are going to be bad for a while. However, there is a spirit of resilience, and you know, even you read that article in the in the the laborers in the in the stalls in Mexico City, for their livelihood's sake, they need to continue to work. This is a population that has always needed to work, and why I'm so happy to have been involved with Acción's work for the last two decades, um, because it truly allows them to gain the access to the capital to work, um, which they need. Um, but, you know, the next gen in Latin America, I'll stop with this and let you talk, Michael, but the next generation of um, the Hidalgos, I call them, you know, the, the, the folks that grew up with means, folks that were able to come to study in places like Notre Dame, you know, they've gone back to their, their countries, and if they have to live in gated communities for the rest of their lives to feel peace and security, I don't think that's what they want. So I see now on some of my other boards, I work on an education board in Latin America uh, with very prominent Latins who really want to make a change in the education system. I talked about Indian health. Um, there we have tremendous amount of Latin Americans as well who want to be able to change the systems. You know, this is what it's going to take. And I, I do have a lot of optimism that, that we will get there, but it's going to be painful for a bit. So I'll stop there. Sorry. Michael, maybe over to you. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much there, Tara, that that um, resonates, uh, and I think uh, you spoke to it very powerfully. But maybe just to pick up on on one thing, which is maybe the thing that gives me the most hope, and that's um, the human capital in, in the region uh, and the incredible energy and creativity and entrepreneurialism that we see in, in civil society. Um, you know, you've worked more on the economic side, and, and I've I've worked more sort of in the 
um, you know, the fields of justice and human rights and, and now uh, kind of democratic governance. But, but I think we, we see the same thing, which is just, uh, you know, generations of uh, incredibly committed and, and talented people um, who in, in, some, in some cases are held back by um, their own societies and, and, and governing structures. And, and one of the challenges uh, I think for, for the US government uh, in thinking about how to engage with the region is how to tap uh, and cultivate and partner uh, with some of those uh, some of those individuals, um, even when at the government to government level we don't have necessarily the kinds of, of partners that we would like, um, and, and that's that's frankly where um, organizations. I mean, you mentioned two of them, Acción and Notre Dame, right? Have have done incredible work. I remember the very first trip I took uh, to Colombia as a, as a newly kind of minted human rights lawyer. I was in the office of um, the director of what at the time was the um, the most prominent Colombian human rights organization, and uh, on the wall, you know, very proudly displayed was a a flyer from a um, a panel discussion at the University of Notre Dame uh, at the Kellogg Institute, where this this particular human rights defender had spent a, a year, um, you know, when when he really needed to get out of Colombia for for security reasons in, in the eighties at a at a very kind of difficult and violent time, uh, and so. Uh, I think you're right, Tara, to highlight um, the work that, that Notre Dame itself has done uh, to support and, and cultivate and, and, and educate um, a generation of, of leaders, and now probably more than one generation of leaders, um, yeah. that, uh, that is probably what gives me the greatest hope for uh, the future of the region, uh, even at a time where clearly there's going to be some really deep challenges. Ray, I think you're muted. I might come in on this a little bit more from the development side and, and maybe offer sort of two, two um, points. Both of these are, are I guess, I put in the category of concerns, although I share a lot of Michael's optimism about the, the strength of human capital and the experience of democracy that the continent has gone through over the last, you know, probably about 30 years. And um, when I started in Latin America, many of the countries were, were dictatorships or authoritarian regimes. And it was this incredible democratic spring. And uh, there were a whole generation of young people that went through that are now, you know, much are older and their children have kind of lived that experience. And so I end up being optimistic about that human capital and how it can drive growth, the strength of the institutions, the investments that have been made in the region, even, you know, quite spectacularly the economic growth that's occurred. I mean, in some, several years ago, Peru had a 9% growth rate, was the highest growth rate in the world um, for a country, and yet we don't necessarily hear about these Latin American countries and, and the, uh, the, the extraordinary growth that's going on. Two worries, however, one is climate change. Um, and we don't hear much about climate change in, in Latin America. Now we're witnessing the impacts of it on the, the Gulf Coast. Uh, we're witnessing it in California. We're witnessing everything that the climate scientists said about um, extreme weather, and this is only gonna get worse. Well, what does it mean in Latin America? It means the same, you know, some of the same kinds of things that we're seeing here. The, in some sense, we're seeing uh, threats to the Amazon, which many would describe as the lungs of the world. Um, we're seeing continued cutting and burning of the Amazon. And, and under the current government, there's been, you know, he is in, the, the pre current president has kind of opened up the Amazon for um, more, more exploration and more, um, more development, more cattle raising which basically accelerates the destruction of the rainforest. And so it's, you know, that, that's, uh, a, I think, a really a critical challenge for, the, for Brazil and also for the, for the continent, or for the hemisphere, I'd probably, it's probably even fair to say. And then, um, and then in Central America, climate change manifests itself in a somewhat different way, more subtle, but actually we see the, we see the symptom on our border, which is the uh, climate change has actually been destroying the coffee crop across Central America. So coffee growers are cutting the trees down and they don't, and they have no other options um, in terms of livelihood. So they head to the north, they head north to the border. And this is happening all over Central America. There's a disease that's called coffee rust that's been created and it's basically destroying crops up and down the of Central America. And so um, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing livelihoods destroyed by climate change, precipitating, you know, climate induced migration which is something we're seeing all over the world actually. And that actually is likely to accelerate if we don't get you know, it's not just about climate anymore. It's gonna be a climate and population movement associated with climate. The other issue that for me is of some concern is the whole issue of inequality. Um, Latin America historically has been a, a, a region characterized by rather extreme inequality amongst um, classes within those societies. 
Um, and, it, you know, to some degree, it's been addressed by economic growth, but there's still a good deal, you know, that needs to be done. And to some degree, inequality can also have an effect in compromising democratic governance. And I think we see that in some locations where we've seen, you know, sig significant amounts of uh, poverty, uh, excuse me, corruption and, and, um, and the fall of, political, uh, of particular political regimes as a consequence of, the, of their, their heads of state and also some of their ministers being implicated in some of these, uh, th these activities. So those are things I think that, that are going to have to be addressed. I think actually globally, inequality has now become a global conversation and, um, and we're gonna to have to, I think, figure out ways to kind of grapple with that uh, and grapple with you know, trying to create more equitable societies for, um, for citizens across the world. Um, I think with that, I think we're right at about the time we wanna to switch to um, maybe listening to you a little bit and maybe taking some of your questions um, and some of you uh, have, you know, sent some questions to us um, by um, by email. But um, before we um, uh, before we enter that period, let me just give you a little bit of information about how this was all going to work. Um, we want to invite each of you to fill out a form that you can see in the chat function to submit a question to our panelists. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'm going to start with a, a couple of questions that we've already gotten, but I'd like to encourage you all to you know, submit anything that you, that you would like. And there is a link, I think, that you may have gotten uh, to, to enable you to do that. Uh, and you can actually, in that, you can indicate you know, who, to whom that question is actually being directed. So um, if you can go, go to that link, um, that should be in your, in your invitation. Um, and... Um, uh, and, I, and I will, you know, offer those, I will uh, sort of put those questions to our panelists. And there is one, one right off the bat, I think that, uh, it, interestingly enough, someone is asking, do, um, do, uh, uh, do Tar and I know uh, Jacqueline Nov Novogratz, who heads Acumen? Both of us actually are very good friends of Jacqueline's, and she's actually won a major award at the Kellogg Institute um, for her work on particularly inve uh, impact investing in microfinance. And Tara, you might want to say a few words about her since you're very close friends with her. Um, I will be happy to. And in fact, I think when we had to submit uh, some people that we really look up to in our industry, she and Sir Ronald Cohen are the two that have inspired me in my work forever and ever. And um, Jacqueline actually and I grew up in baby banking 101 in 1983 at the Chase Manhattan Bank, now known as J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and we both entered as bright eyed bushy tail. We want to save the world uh, students. I just come back from Peru and she just come back from some fellowship she had in Africa, I believe. And we got in there and we didn't know a debit from a credit. And that was something Father Ted said to me. You've got to figure out the financial the financial world. So. Um, I learned my debits and my credits, so did Jacqueline. She went back to Africa and spent uh, a great deal of her career in launching her business called Acumen, which is a patient capital. It brings um, what we talk about, that layer um, for the stacking of what you need beyond philanthropy to make all of this work. And I so highly admire Jacqueline and what she's done at Acumen and beyond. And uh, Ray and I were privileged to give her the, the Kellogg Prize several years ago at Notre Dame, her first port of call. Um, no, that's that's a nice re reminder. Thank you for that for that question. So we got a great question that goes right to the heart of our conversation about globalization. And I think one of the things that's happening today is there's a you know a, a bit of a retreat from globalization on the part of many citizens who are worried about jobs and livelihoods. And the question really goes to the heart of that, in which the question is really, you know, um, many people believe that, uh, or opponents of globalization believe that, you know, uh, uh, that jobs and pay uh, are really at the heart of the problem. And, um, and they, they're building support for this sort of anti-globalization perspective, um, believing that their income has been suppressed or in some ways compromised by overseas corporations that pay less and uh, maybe even are using um, imprisoned labor. So do any of us have any comments on you know, that aspect of it, this sort of job competition question that, that occurs in supply chains? I don't know, Michael, do you wanna take a shot at that one? I'm not sure whether that's something you're, that's in your brief at uh, the dialogue. Um, jump in as well. Uh, I, yeah, well, I'd, I'd, I'd yeah, be interested in, in your perspectives on this. Um, look, I, I, I guess I would say maybe, maybe two things without being a specialist in this area. I mean, the first is, um, 
uh, clearly, this is this is a very real trend. I think the one you you point to, and and it's it's coming from a very real place, right? I think we have to to acknowledge that um, the the enthusiasm for for free trade, um, uh, you know, while it often paid lip service to um, to the to the losers, um, uh, probably didn't do enough to to really take into consideration um, the people whose whose jobs were um, and livelihoods were affected. Um, by by globalization and and we've seen the backlash uh, to mm -hmm. that. So uh, you know I think in our in our national political conversation, really across across the political spectrum, we're so polarized about about so many things. But um, but there seems to be you know kind of a broader consensus that um, at the very least we need to be thinking much more carefully about you know labor and environmental standards um, as. Uh, as, as we you know, engage in, in free trade discussions in order not to encourage uh, a race to the bottom. And so, um, so that's, you know, I, I don't see that as, uh, as necessarily a kind of a negative thing, but, um, um, but, uh, but the, the kind of nationalism and nativism um, that, that is a part of this, I think is, is problematic. Um, there are, uh, frankly, for, for, the, for the region we're talking about, Latin America, there may be some advantages to, uh, to nearshoring, to especially the, um, the 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 stuff that's going on with China in terms of you know especially you know U.S. companies, but also some multinationals trying to to think about diversifying their supply chains away away from China and away from away from Asia. So there, you know, you know, talking about Mexico and places like Central America and Colombia, there may actually be some some opportunities to be seized here, but but. Um, but overall, I think you know what what we need to try to get back to is is higher standard uh, globalization and not not a backlash uh, against the the whole enterprise, which um, will will ultimately I think uh, be to, uh, to to everybody's detriment. Um, but um, I'm sure Tara has a you know more more you know uh, much more more deep thoughts on on these issues. I don't know if they're deep thoughts, Michael, but I'm struck by the whole notion of the future of work and how much that is changing both here in our own country and certainly abroad. Um, and, you know, being able to provide jobs because at day end, the poor, they want to work. They, they have dignity. They don't want handouts. I, I truly believe that in the human spirit, it, there is the power to try to advance yourself. And, and that's what they want an opportunity. And this future of work um, notion, I think, is here to stay. And that I think there's some really good work being done on the future of work. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll also go back to to thinking about the Latin American economies and how much there's unemployment, and then there's underemployment. There's the informal sector that all of us that have been to the region see. Uh, the people in the market stalls. They don't have access to social security. They don't have insurance. They're not, they're not even on government ledgers because they don't pay taxes because their businesses, it's hand to mouth type of business. That's also why they're such at risk for COVID. They can't afford not to work. They have to go to work. So the whole, the whole notion of unemployment and underemployment and, and unfortunately we've never been able to break that vicious cycle in Latin America. And Ray, Ray, you have far more expertise than I do with your great work at Oxfam and the Ford Foundation. You might offer some perspectives here for us as well. Yeah, I would just add a few points. Um, one of them is on the future of work. Um, I think one of the interesting questions around this issue of, of uh, job loss and um, and wage stagnation has to do with the fact that you know is it is it about trade and free trade or is it about automation? And a lot of the evidence suggests that, as Tara is suggesting, a lot of this is is about. Um, automation and, and uh, accelerating automation in our own labor markets. But it also, I think we have to be fair that it is about the way the United States has practiced free trade. And uh, the one thing I will say about that, maybe for, for, for the audience to reflect upon is that many of the countries that we are competing with in the international marketplace actually have what is known as industrial policy. They actually think strategically about how they want to position in the global marketplace um, in particular areas and their governments. China does this, Germany does this, many of the Europeans, they think in very deliberate fashion about their global positioning um, and they, they just don't leave it to the marketplace to set prices for everything. Um, but they're, you know, they're thinking very conscious, consciously about what are the impacts going to be on their broader society. We have not done that. There has not been a discussion in the United States 
about industrial policy in literally decades. Um, and in fact, in Washington, it's almost, it's almost dead on arrival, that conversation when you bring it up. That's changing now, interestingly, because there's a realization that in the Midland of the United States, there's a lot of discontent and that we're actually not as competitive as we've been in the past for precisely the reasons that we don't have this kind of, this kind of thoughtful um, uh, attention to industrial policy. The other issue I think is really interesting to think a little bit about is the inequality question. And the fact that many of us had grown up in a time when um, compensation was linked to productivity. And during, when globalization got going, one of, the, one of the things that was interesting to track or look, for, look at is American workers were told, well, you need to be more productive. So, so American workers increased productivity spectacularly. I mean, if you look at productivity increases over the last several decades, it, it, it increases dramatically. However, wages stagnated. And so wages have been flat and productivity has gone through the roof. Um, when we had a more equitable society, that was actually, um, those things tracked each other pretty steadily. And that is no longer actually the case. So these are things I think as we're watching the current political debate and we're heading toward elections, um, I think we're going to have to pay, give some greater attention to. So um, with that, um, my, uh, it's my uh, sad duty <laughs> to have to bring this really, what was starting to be a really exciting conversation. I think we had a lot more we could be talking about on all of these issues. I was gonna start going into, I just wanna say one thing, I wanna put in a plug for future of work for those of you who are alumni, so you know about this. The university's actually taken this on in a big way. I'm also, I also um, am heading something called the McKenna Center for, um, Human Development and Global Business at the Keough School. And one of the, um, the areas that we're really focusing on is uh, future of work. And we actually have, we've been doing some work with Mayor Pete in South Bend on this issue. He's a, been ch a big champion of this question um, nationally. He's been on the National Conference of Mayors as the chairman of the, uh, the um, Artificial Intelligence and um, Automation Task Force for the National Conference of Mayors. Within the university, we've just gotten an enormous grant from the Lilly Foundation to work on advanced manufacturing in the engineering school. Um, we just got another grant that's actually supporting a, um, a technology, a com computers and society or artificial intelligence society. We're looking at sort of the implications of artificial intelligence on society and on work as one aspect of that. There's another big con contribution that's coming in from IBM that's supporting a tech and society initiative in the arts and letters college. So Notre Dame is actually recognizing that it's in Indiana and the state that's very affected by these issues is trying to take a leadership role um, and is in uh, rather significant dialogue at high levels with the manufacturing community in Indianapolis, with the governor's office, with Purdue and with IU on these questions. So something to be excited about, keep an eye on uh, in the future. And with that, I, I wanna thank um, effusively my, my buddies here, Tara and Michael, good friends. Uh, for a, a stimulating conversation and for their taking time to join us today um, and share their work as global citizens. As you can see, we've got some really some exciting folks working in the field um, representing both the university and university's values. Um, and I think, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, their work is both confirmation and reinsurance that there are terrific ND grads out there in the world uh, and working for the good of us all as Father Hesburgh uh, and as Tara comment as Father Hesburgh would hope that we would be doing. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Mary Scott and um, Do Dolly Duffy and the staff at the Alumni uh, Association, who's, who really are the people behind the scenes who are bringing us all together in, in this fashion. Um, next week, and I hope you will join us next week, um, we'll meet again, but this time at 9 a.m. in the morning, and we're going to hear from, um, and we're doing that because we have to accommodate time zones, time zone differences. And next week, we're going to hear from Brian Brisson, uh, Minister Counselor for Commercial Affairs with the Embassy of the United States uh, in Mexico, who's from the class of 1985. And we're gonna hear from Kagwira Maguri from the class of 1997, who was the chairperson of Kenya's National Commission on Human Rights, and David Gauss from the Andean Commission on, what is it, Tarek, help me? Andean Health and Development. Andean Health and Development Program um, that was inspired by Father Hesper. I'll be moderating next week's uh, session as well. So I look forward to seeing you then. To prepare for our next week's discussion, please check out the videos and resources we've got on Think ND, and also feel free to share this series with your friends. We're accepting registrations throughout the program and the, on, the links online and the invitation. You can register online as, as I think you did. So um, there's no cap on, on registration. So um, 
I hope you'll join us next week and hope you'll invite a friend or encourage some other uh, fellow alumni to join us as well. So with that, um, I will uh, uh, close the session. Thank you all again for coming and I hope we'll, you'll join us next week. God bless, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, God bless. Michael and Tara. Go Irish. <laughs> Go Irish. <Thank> <laughs>